Hello, magical people of the internet. I am Jen, and welcome to my vlog, I Never Thought I Would, where we talk about things, um, or we talk about doing things we never thought we would do, and the incredible places that they could lead us. And I started this vlog to help stay focused and motivated during this pandemic, which is a time we never thought we would experience. So I'd also like to challenge you to do something you never thought you would do and let me know where it leads you. Today, we have a really special guest. We have author of Crazy About Kurt and screenwriter Will Link. Hi, Will. Welcome to the show. Hey, Jen. It's great to see you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm so excited that you could come here at, well, on Zoom, that you can meet me on Zoom. Yeah, and well, talk it's, about. It's, that's the new place to meet everybody, so. It's where everybody meets. I know so many people who, like, <laughs> met their person on Zoom. Thanks so much for coming, and I'm really excited to have you talk about doing something you never thought you would do and where it led you. So should I should I dive right into that then? You want to? Yes. Let me tell you what there are uh, in 2020. There are lots of things I never thought I would do. But, <laughs> I but you wanted something that uh, is, you know, uh, magical. And I will tell you this: yes. um, the one thing, and it feels kind of obvious in my life, but also because it's probably the most important decision I ever made in my life. And I never thought. I would leave New York and move to Los Angeles. Okay. Um, as everybody listening to this and watching this right now can probably tell, I am from New York. I have the accent to prove it. And I was very much a, well, you can't leave New York. You can't, you can't. I had very much the Sinatra, I can make it here, I can make it anywhere attitude. And as people I knew would leave, I would get like really mad. I'm like, well, I'm not going anywhere. Like I was in my early twenties, a real stickler about that. Like I was really like, no, this is the place to be. This is the best city in the world. And then suddenly and very abruptly, I found myself moving to Los Angeles and making that call like very quickly. So I never thought I would do that. So what brought that about, that like drastic change in your mindset? What lured you out to La La Land? <laughs> well, like everyone, fame and fortune. I had, uh, you know, I'd been writing and trying to make short films in New York. And I had written a feature screenplay with a friend of mine who a year previously, he, I remember he met me at a deli in somewhere in Midtown. And he was like, look, it's like, we got to move to LA. I'm going, you got to come with me. And I said, no, I said, I'm staying here. We're doing it here. And he goes, well, I'm leaving. He moved out. But we had the script that we were still working on, even from a distance. Mm -hmm. And um, eventually the script started to get some attention. Okay. So now we see what's changing my mind here. Like, and it started to get a little bit of buzz. It was a zombie script. And this is in, this is in 2005 now. So before the big zombie boom of the late 2000s. Yeah, was it kind of like Circa Shaun of the Dead? Yeah, it was just after that. Okay. Um, and we had, we had ended up getting a manager. It was totally random. But this manager worked with us and I was in New York and Jared, my writing partner, was in LA and we were still making everything work. And we spec the script and we happened to spec the script um, on a weekend that a zombie movie came out, a George Romero zombie movie, Land of the Dead, and that bombed. So everyone was like, nobody wants zombies, which I believe <laughs> always stayed that way, right? Nobody ever wanted zombies again. I got a call from the manager. He goes, look, nobody wanted to buy the script. Everyone wants to meet you. What can you do? Can you come out here? And I said, I could take a week off of work. I was working for a local television station at the time. And I said, I could take a week off of work. I said, schedule as many meetings as you can for 
one week and I'll go out to LA. And I had the total like Woody Allen and Annie Hall thing of Los Angeles of it's just like, like, ah, no, nah, they don't, everything out there is BS and who needs it? Uh, the manager scheduled 17 meetings for one week for us. <laughs> and I, I was his manager? It was insane. <laughs> well, look, look, he wasn't, he's no longer my manager, so he wasn't that great. We never sold a script. But, but he, he scheduled 17 meetings for one week. And I came out here, stayed with my writing partner. We went to 17 meetings that week. It was a whirlwind. Like we were meeting everywhere. And I remember we would go to certain companies and I was such a snob. Like we'd go to uh, Jerry Bruckheimer's company and I'd be like, Jerry Bruckheimer, like he just makes those big dumb action films. I don't, I have more artistic integrity. integrity. And, then we'd, and then we'd leave that meeting and I'd be like, I will do anything Jerry Bruckheimer wants me to do. Like I would drink the Kool-Aid everywhere I went. And it was like just a, an amazing week of being like, a real crash course in the industry and pitching and meeting with development people. And I remember I, I flew back to New York and I'm like, oh, that LA, that LA's not that bad. <laughs> and, and I went to work, I was working an overnight shift at this television station. And I remember the next morning after getting off my shift, I put in my two weeks notice and I called my writing partner, Jared, and I said, Jared, find a two bedroom apartment. I'm coming out there. I'll be there in three weeks. And three weeks later, I moved to LA. That is a whirlwind. But you yeah. know what? It kind of, it, it definitely makes sense because like you came to LA and you had all that momentum and you got to take 17 meetings with people like Jerry Bruckheimer's company. Yeah, one day I'm having lunch on the Warner Brothers lot with a development guy. Granted, he's like nobody, but he's a development guy. And then I'm back. And it's a lot at Warner Brothers. And when you're coming from New York City, yeah. you know, and you get to, and you get on to all these studio lots and to these, you know, big shot offices, you're like wide eyed. And yeah. Like, oh my God, this is it. I belong here. And then you go back and I'm working this, like perfectly reasonable, but like soul sucking job. Not that I still don't work some soul sucking jobs, but because I was such like a New York guy, I still had to do it fast. Like I had to commit to it and do it fast, like pulling off a band aid. Yeah. Like I had to go in three weeks and be, be in LA. And I think a lot of times, like we wrestle with these big life decisions. And I think. Like sometimes you just have to go with your gut and do it fast and don't overthink it. And I didn't over, and, and usually yeah. big decisions, like I overthink to the point of like, I'm, I might mess it up, but this, I didn't overthink. And I came out here and it was the best thing I did because not only did it help, I think me creatively, because now I was with, I was making friends with a lot more creative people. I was in an environment that kind of, nurtured the thing I love, which was, was film and filmmaking and stuff like that. And I know LA gets like a bad rap of people being phony and people, and look, there's a lot of that, but there's a lot of that everywhere. And you gotta just find your people. Like that's the, that's the big thing in life overall. You just gotta find your people. And I found yeah. like the right group of, of creative film nerds out here. And I don't think in LA people are necessarily full of shit in the way that people assume before they come out to LA, because I think the city lures or has an allure for dreamers. So everyone's aspirational. They're not lying. They're just not yeah. what, they, what they're saying they are yet. But yeah. they believe they will be. You know, I think the thing that you run into a lot out here is people who, like when I came out of film school, I was like, I'm gonna make my movie. And then I'm like, well, you know, as you, as you kind of get a little older, you're like, oh, well, I'm gonna sell that script and someone else will make the movie. And then it's like, well, I'm not gonna sell that script, but they're gonna like it enough that I'm gonna get a uncredited rewrite job for Scooby-Doo 3. And <laughs> you, but, but that's kind of healthy, you know, because it's like, I want to be paid to write. And that's, that's good. And that's better than most people would get. And, and you do run out into here and I've run into 
fair number of, of people on the acting end in particular who they say they want to act but really they want to be like Julia Roberts where really uh, a girl I knew she was very upset that she was always getting sent out for these parts that were like the best friend or like the goofy neighbor and she's like like, I, I should be getting going out for the lead parts. And someone said to her, they said this to her face, which was harsh, but true. They said, they said, did you ever think that you're not Lucy, that you're Ethel? And she was so offended about it. But the fact of the matter is she'd have been a great Ethel and like she'd be acting and she'd be working. And well, she'd be, she'd probably be at a different plateau of her career if she accepted the Ethel yes. and leaned into the Ethel as opposed to trying to be the Lucy all the time. There are lots of different career trajectories where you can start off as an Ethel and become a Lucy. And I think Brittany Murphy is kind of a perfect example of that. Yes. You know, um, because when she started off, she was kind of like the quirky, sidekicky best friend. You know, in Clueless, she was the she was the one they were given the makeover to, girl from the other side of the tracks. And then she ended up having a phenomenal career and she had the longevity that Alicia Silverstone didn't necessarily yeah. have. I don't even know if Alicia Silverstone was interested in pursuing an acting career in her adult life. I, I don't really know much about it. But I think knowing where you fit and then taking that opportunity and then evolving from there. And, and that's something that really that changed about me with being out here as a writer. And it's something that I might not have gotten a hold of if I didn't come to LA and meet other screenwriters or other people who were really making these creative pursuits. It's that you gotta, you gotta be willing to evolve and do different things. And, and, and you shouldn't look at being like, even on the writing sense, like being the ethical of writers, like you shouldn't look at that as a, like a, a, a negative. You should look at that as a challenge and something to go and something to grow from. And, and somebody and who grow. has a job. You look at it as somebody yeah. who has a job versus somebody who's waiting tables. There are so many different tiers, but the difference is, are you in the game or are you out of the game? And it's like, if you're going to sit on the sidelines until you can be the star, then you're going to be, your ass is going to fall asleep there. I would love to just be paid just just direct. It really did, moving out here exposed me to a lot of stuff and a lot of life stuff that it, I don't think, well, I'm sure my life in New York would have been just fine, but I, I, I think it's better here. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I guess um, New York was kind of your comfort zone. You were familiar with New York. You had a network of family and friends in New York, and then you kind of just took this huge leap in three weeks, <laughs> you know? I always, <laughs> like, at the beginning of the month, you were about to go to L.A. for a week to take some yeah. to take some meetings, and by the end of the month, you were going back to L.A. to live there. <laughs> so um, that's that's pretty amazing. But also, just the amount of growth involved in making that decision, making the decision quickly, because when we do take a long time, a lot of times we talk ourselves out of it and the emotion um, of the momentum dissipates and it's so much easier, so, so, so much easier to talk ourselves out of doing things than to talk ourselves yeah. into doing things. Because you know? taking that leap and doing the thing is, is what's scary. It's exactly. easy to just be like, well, I'll just stay here. Yeah, so th that's really incredible. That's such an inspiring, inspiring story, Will. It's um, funny, though, when, when I think about it, though, I tell the story of, like, coming from New York as if I was coming from, like, somewhere in Nebraska or something, like, in the middle. But it, it's, your home is your home, and it's always going to be a certain, there's always going to be a certain comfort level and acquaintance to it, even if it is one of the biggest cities in the world. Yeah, but also jumping jumping into the deep end and into the unknown and going somewhere unfamiliar is unfamiliar. I don't think it's necessarily about going from a big city to another big city. Yeah. It's going, it's starting over. It's starting from zero all over again. 
I will say this, I did have it easier than most because like I said, I had the writing partner who did find a wonderful two bedroom apartment and I still live in that apartment building. I'm a, he no longer lives with me, but I, I, I still live in the same spot. So maybe I'm not like venturing out, but you know, rent control. What are you going to do? Yeah, no, and, of course. <laughs> and, uh, but he found a place to live. We had a manager and he had been there a year struggling to meet new people. And when I came in, I'm like, oh, you people are now my friends too. But then I, along the way, made, made a whole. And he left. Um, so we, we were out here for five years together. He, um, we wrote a whole bunch of scripts, came very close on some sales. Um, Eventually, we parted way with our manager, and eventually, because of some things going on in his life, he had to move back to New Jersey. But I stayed here, and then, you know, it was tough because I didn't have the writing partner that I had out here anymore. And I kind of got a little away from, and, and this, again, gets to the you can't be afraid to try different things, and you can't just stick to I'm only going to do this, because then I started getting into thing, other creative uh, outlets. Like I started doing a lot of podcasting. You came on my podcast many years ago. Yes, I did. Uh, um, and then I also got a lot into personal essay writing. Mm -hmm. And I found this community out here in LA of where you would do these comedic essay readings and things like that. Was it like, like Moth? It's kind of like the Moth. Like they, they got a bunch of them out here. One uh, is Sit and Spin is a pretty well-known one out here. Uh, uh, and yeah, they're kind of like the Moth, they're these storytelling shows. And I would go and perform, write these pieces of things that have happened in my life and go perform them at, at these shows. And it was like this new form of writing that I hadn't really explored and that was really exciting. And then that kind of led to, I think the hybrid of my screenwriting and storytelling essay writing was I decided to write a novel and publish a novel. Tell so, us about the novel. Okay, I'm gonna be shameless. Shame, shameless all the way. Crazy about Kurt, you can buy it. Well, you can buy it on Amazon right now. Um, you could also- I will have the link below. So if anyone's interested in Crazy About Kurt, you're going to hear all about it now. And it's funny, the novel kind of brought me a lot back to my New York roots because it's about the 90s and it's about growing up in the 90s. It's almost, to use the film terms, it's almost like American Graffiti or Dazed and Confused, but for the 1990s. And yeah, it it's super nostalgic. Yeah, it's really seeped in nostalgia because I realized... The 90s didn't really have, that doesn't really have an American graffiti or a dazed and confused. They don't have a really, what I would consider accurate look at, at how teenagers were in that time before the internet. It takes place over one night and follows four uh, Long Island high school students. And the backdrop is, it takes place on the day they found out Kurt Cobain killed himself. So the opening of the book uh, is each of the characters finding this news out. Not all of them are Nirvana fans. Like some of them aren't into to Kurt Cobain and others are kind of devastated. But that is more of a specter that hangs over the story. And they basically, they still have to deal with all their teenage problems. Like they still have to deal with like, oh, am I going to lose my virginity? Or does that guy like me and all the, all the teenage angsty bullshit that we all can relate to. Yeah. And, and that, that's, that's the book in a nutshell. I love the book. I found it so interesting because Kurt Cobain's suicide was one of the hugest cultural, like, I don't even know the word for it, but in the 90s, that was like the most epic kind of thing that happened if you were a teenager. Like, yeah. if you were a teenager in the 90s, Kurt Cobain's death, like you said, whether you're a fan of his or not, it totally impacted the zeitgeist of the era. Yeah. 
it's one of those you remember where you were when you heard it kind of exactly kind of for exactly. people of our generation yes definitely but yeah i remember how impactful it was and just that whole 90s teenage generation turned very dark like teenage culture kind of took a turn into into the darkness yeah and look, the, the book, it, like some of these characters are dealing with some, some, some heavy shit and some of the stories are a little, a little lighter and they all kind of start to, to, to connect. Because like you said, no matter who you were, it was, in the, it was in the zeitgeist, especially like I have it taking place that day. So even though they're dealing with all these other things, that's still there. And also even though like this is a book about teenagers in the 90s and it's also very... East Coast, suburban, Long Island centric. Like I could watch a movie like American Graffiti and I was not alive in 1962. And I was never like, even as a kid, I was never into cars, like the car culture of that movie. But I get it because I get all the things those teenagers were feeling and I get like all the way. So even if, you, so I think this plays not just well for people our age who are gonna, gonna really sink their teeth into the nostalgia, but people even younger will find something relatable about it in the same way that we relate to. to Definitely. Uh, yeah. Definitely. Teenagers are, teenagers are always, are always kind of the same. There's new shit they're doing, but it's always like the, they're dealing with the same, a teenager day is dealing with the same emotions we were dealing as teenagers and, that our parents dealt with as teenagers. Well, because there's that universal of, you feel like you're an adult, but you're not an adult. You don't have autonomy, but you want autonomy. You know, yeah. you're, you have these hormones, you know, that are confusing and you want to do adult stuff. You're not sure if you're ready to do adult stuff. You experiment with adult stuff, whether it's drugs or sex or whatever, whatever it may be. But yeah, it's definitely relatable. And I think, um, like you said, teenaged angst, like, it just, it, it repeats itself every generation. And I'll, I'll tell you what, uh, crazy about Kurt, I don't, uh, it's another thing that, you know, I'm sure if I stayed in New York, I would have kept writing, but I might not have written something like this because I wouldn't have had the distance from, that's the good thing about getting away from home. It gives you distance and perspective about what your life was like there and, and, and things about that. And I, I think I definitely, think about my past in a more thoughtful way than if I was say still there and still like living in it in a way. Yeah. And you can understand the specificity of where you came from. Yeah. Oh, there are things about my hometown that I didn't realize at the time. Like sadly, I didn't realize how like possibly racist my hometown was. <laughs> like things like things that, and granted things that are coming out more in the Trump era. I never noticed those things about my town because I was, I was, I was in it. You can't see the forest for the trees. Kind of oh, thing. And also you're not self-aware yet. And one of the things I, one of the things that was fun about writing the book is um, because there's like an om omniscient narrator talking about what's going on in these kids' heads. So the teens have messy thoughts and ideas about things that I think just that we talk about in 2020, like we, we talk about race and sexism and things in a way that we didn't in the 90s. But they were still ideas that were floating in our heads somewhere, but we weren't talking about them, we weren't dealing with it. So one of the fun things in the writing of the book is I, I'm able to address what's going on in their heads and these thoughts they might have about these things that, you know, it almost makes me want to write a sequel where these characters are like then in today and, and, and how they're dealing with this stuff. So maybe you should, maybe I had thought about it while in, in quarantine, but I ended up writing, I've ended up going back to, to writing a script. So, yeah. You know. So that's what I'm working on now, a new screenplay. Great. Well, that's exciting. Can you tell us a little bit about what the screenplay is about, or you're not ready to talk about it? I will just say this. It, it came from, I'm writing it with a, a, a different writing partner, a, a friend out here, and 
I don't think we would have been able to write something alone during this time because it's very stressful. But having a support system and having somebody to bounce ideas off, this friend of mine I'm writing with, he, he's a very good director, but he hasn't directed a feature. And I was giving him a lot of shit that like, you have to direct a feature, forget the shorts, you just gotta do it yourself, no one else is gonna do it. And I said, there's a way to do this. We write something that takes place in one location. And before I knew it, I was writing a script with them. So I will say this, it's something very low budget that we believe that when this COVID nightmare is over, we can shoot this. Mm -hmm. And it's a very doable thing. And that's what, uh, that's what I'm looking to do uh, once this is over. So thank you so much, Will, for sharing your journey. And thank you so much for having me. Oh, our, my pleasure. Oh, my goodness. Can't, it was so nice to see you. I haven't seen you in so long. Um, I hope all of you out there get a chance to check out his fabulous book, Crazy About Kurt. And it is about teenage angst on the day Kurt Cobain killed himself in the 90s. And all of you out there, I would like to challenge you to do something you never thought you would do because you never know where it's going to lead you. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And in the comments, let me know what you are going to do that you never thought you would. And if you already did something like that, let me know where it led you. Thanks so much and have a great day.